just like to start by saying thanks very much to Dan for the introduction and to SDSC to, for having me. It's just a, a wonderful honor and a delight to, to be here on this occasion. So I thank you for including me. Uh, with respect to the subject at hand, uh, on the last panel, Elliot Cohen somehow managed to restrain himself from talking about primacy. Uh, luckily, I don't have to do so. So uh, the other presentations on the panel are largely about uh, the discipline of strategic studies and its future. My, my charge is a little bit different, uh, perhaps to set the stage a bit by talking about the practice of grand strategy and its future, and specifically uh, American grand strategy in the post-Cold War era. So how it's evolved over the past 25 years, uh, what its prospects are for the future. And so I'm going to do so by making three overarching points over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, first, that the United States has in fact had a fairly coherent and consistent grand strategy since the end of the Cold War. Uh, second, that this grand strategy has actually been uh, more effective than not in shaping the international environment to our liking. Uh, but then third, that this grand strategy and the broader international system that it supports are now under greater stress today uh, than at any time in the past 25 years. Uh, and so to get, to get right into this, uh, I think the first thing you have to understand about post-Cold War grand strategy is, is just to get past this myth that the U.S. has not actually had a coherent or consistent grand strategy since containment. Uh, and this is a myth that uh, I have admittedly contributed to to some degree uh, in earlier work. And it, I think it reflects the fact that there have been very real policy differences uh, both uh, across and even within post-Cold War presidential administrations on a range of important issues. But, but in fact, there's nonetheless been uh, significant consistency across this period in the fundamental objectives of American strategy, uh, as well as many of the key initiatives that make up that strategy. And I'll just say parenthetically, I think that this is something that often uh, people who are not from the United States are better uh, placed to appreciate than, than we Americans are ourselves. Uh, and so since the end of the Cold War, uh, there have been three major goals of American strategy by my reckoning. Uh, first, to uh, perpetuate American international primacy. Uh, second, to extend and to deepen the liberal international order uh, that initially took root in, in the West, the non-communist world, following uh, World War II. Uh, and then third, uh, very broadly, to address and meet the emerging or resurgent threats that might mess up that order. Uh, every post-Cold War administration has committed to those goals in one way or another. Uh, you can find them in every national or defense strategy document that's been issued since the early 1990s, dating back to the Pentagon's defense planning guidance in 1992, uh, up through the Obama administration's strategy documents today. Uh, and I would say that every post-Cold War administration has pursued these goals through fairly similar initiatives as well. Uh, maintaining a globe-straddling military posture, preserving and extending uh, America's system of alliances and security commitments, promoting democracy and markets overseas, uh, opposing dangers like nuclear proliferation and international terrorism, seeking to integrate uh, the foremost rising power, China, uh, into the international order while also hedging against the possibility that it might behave aggressively. Uh, all of these policies have been core features of U.S. statecraft under every post-Cold War president. Uh, and so yes, uh, individual policies have changed from Clinton to Bush, from Bush to Obama, just as policies changed from Truman to Eisenhower or Eisenhower to Kennedy during the Cold War. But I, but I think there's enough similarity over time to say that we have indeed had a fairly consistent grand strategy since the Cold War. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that this grand strategy has actually been fairly successful over time. Uh, and this is contrary to the critique you will often hear within the American Academy, which is that post-Cold War foreign policy has been sort of a profligate disaster, that the U.S. has essentially uh, squandered its moment of international primacy by tilting at geopolitical windmills. Uh, now, it's certainly true that there have been plenty of errors of uh, omission and commission during the past 25 years. There have been setbacks. There have even been uh, some very counterproductive things that you might qualify, quantify, um, you might characterize as disasters, pardon me. Uh, but I think of it this way. Uh, we still generally think that Cold War era grand strategy was more successful than not, despite Vietnam, despite Lebanon, despite all the other missteps and setbacks and traumas that occurred along the way. And so my contention is that, uh, on balance, we can say something similar about post-Cold War grand strategy. Uh, that for all its flaws and imperfections, uh, it's still been more successful than not over the past 25 years. It's helped make the international system more stable, more economically and politically liberal, more advantageous to the United States and its allies than many experts would have predicted at the beginning of the post-Cold War era. Uh, and so to grasp this point, I think it actually helps to go back to the early 1990s. So, so yes, this was the time of you know, the end of history thesis. 
Uh, but it was also the time of some remarkably pessimistic predictions about the future of international affairs. So if you asked uh, international relations experts like John Mearsheimer, uh, sort of, of the realist persuasion, their view was that the end of the Cold War and bipolarity was going to un unleash all sorts of nastiness in the international system. Uh, resurgent Japanese and German militarism, uh, vicious security competitions in Europe and East Asia, rampant nuclear proliferation in these and other areas. Uh, generally speaking, a reversion to multipolar instability and heightened danger of great power war. Uh, there were also fears within, uh, there were also fears that the end of the Cold War would set off uh, trade conflicts and a return to protectionism within the West, without the cohesion that the Cold War had provided holding the West together. Uh, and we, we forget this now, but if you look back at the archival evidence on this period, which is now becoming available, many policymakers in the United States uh, and elsewhere had some of these same fears. And what's remarkable about the past 25 years is that, for the most part, these dogs didn't end up barking. Uh, the post-Cold War world hasn't been perfect by any means. There have been conflicts, there have been crises, outrages, instability, uh, you name it. But I would say that by historical standards, it's been pretty good. It's been a period uh, of relatively low great power tensions, at least until very recently. Uh, it's been a period when great power war has been mercifully absent, uh, a period of relative stability in Europe and East Asia. Uh, a period of significant gains for democracy, markets, and global prosperity. So compared to other eras, uh, things haven't been half bad during the post-Cold War period. Uh, and one of the reasons that this happened, uh, certainly not the only reason, but one of the important reasons, was that the United States, in cooperation with its allies and partners, pursued a grand strategy that was specifically intended to keep these dogs from barking. Uh, we maintained our alliances and forward deployments. We maintained our military primacy precisely to prevent a reversion to a more unstable environment. Uh, we energetically sought to deal with pot potential sources of international instability from uh, loose nuclear materials in the former USSR to uh, Saddam Hussein in the Persian Gulf. We helped extinguish conflicts in places like the Balkans that might indeed have destabilized parts of Europe. So in essence, the United States and its friends uh, worked quite hard and quite deliberately to maintain basic international stability and to foster an environment in which these nice liberal trends like democratization and globalization could continue to advance. Now, this doesn't mean the U.S. strategy has been perfect by any means. Uh, it's fairly easy to tally up uh, all the costs, the risks, the mistakes that have been part of the bargain. Uh, and of course, it would be an enormous exaggeration to say that U.S. policy was solely responsible for these developments. Uh, but I don't think it's at all implausible uh, to argue that the policies of the world's most powerful country did help shape the international environment uh, in these important ways. So I'd say that on the whole, the balance sheet on post-Cold War strategy has been more favorable than not. So that's the second point. Uh, but this brings me to the third point, uh, which is that I, I think U.S. primacy and U.S. grand strategy are more contested and challenged today than any time in the post-Cold War era. Uh, when I say this, I, I want to be very clear. I'm not endorsing the thesis that the world uh, has again become bipolar or even truly multipolar, uh, or the idea that U.S. power has declined so much that we have no choice but to retrench massively as a result. Because I think that at a global level, American primacy is still very much intact, even if it is somewhat diminished from a quarter century ago. Uh, by most measures, the United States still has a substantial economic lead over its closest competitor, which is China. Uh, and if you go beyond just the annual GDP figures and look at statistics like per capita GDP, which is crucial to how much wealth the government can actually mobilize for geopolitical ends, uh, or if you look at more holistic measures like uh, this concept of inclusive wealth, then the lead is even larger. Uh, and then if you add up all the long-term economic and political problems that a country like China faces, I think it makes straight-line projections of Chinese economic ascent and dominance seem pretty problematic. Uh, in the military realm, U.S. global primacy is even more pronounced. U.S. defense spending is still about three times as high as China's, uh, and of course, of course, the U.S. has global power projection capabilities that won't be matched for decades. Uh, as was mentioned yesterday, it also has years of recent experience in complex operations. Uh, the U.S. military has extraordinarily high levels uh, of human capital. Uh, and not least of all, the United States uh, has dozens of allies that add considerably to the overall power of the Western community, uh, as Tom mentioned yesterday, whereas challengers like Russia and China ha have few, if any, allies, and, and those allies are often more liabilities than assets. Uh, and so I could go on, but I think for these and other reasons, it's, it's premature to say that the era of U.S. primacy is ended or that it's going to end uh, anytime soon and that the country has no choice but to fall back radically from its post-Cold War strategy. Uh, what it's not premature to say is that this grand strategy is nonetheless being tested and stressed in ways that are probably greater uh, than at any time since the Cold War. And so I will just uh, briefly mention six key challenges that the U.S. confronts. 
So the first uh, is the return of great power competition. Uh, after 9-11, it was fashionable to say that the biggest threats came from small and weak states. Uh, I think it's pretty clear now that the biggest long-term threats come from big, powerful states. Uh, great power competition has come back with a vengeance. Countries like Russia and China never fully accepted the post-Cold War. Uh, and so now that they have greater capacity to challenge that order, whether that's economic capacity, military capacity, or both, uh, they are, rather unsurprisingly, doing so. Uh, they're seeking to assert primacy within their own regions. They're probing the periphery of the U.S. alliance system. Uh, and notwithstanding what I said earlier about the global military balance, they're developing capabilities that are posing a growing threat to uh, the U.S. ability to project power into Eastern Europe or East Asia. Uh, and so this problem of protracted competition with great power rivals that have their own views of international order, or at the very least of regional order, this is going to be a major challenge ahead. Uh, and it's related to a second challenge, which is that uh, regional military balances in particular are shifting in some very uncomfortable ways. Uh, in Europe, the combination of NATO expanding to the east uh, and Russia's recent military modernization means that the U.S. and its allies actually have a, a, a significant local inferiority in areas along Russian borders, especially in the Baltic and Eastern Europe. Uh, in Asia, the Chinese buildup is increasingly testing uh, the superior, superiority that the U.S. has historically counted on having in the region, uh, particularly within the first island chain and, and especially close to the Chinese mainland, so in a Taiwan contingency, for instance. Uh, and so in each of these cases, you have a combination of military modernization by great power rivals, uh, adverse geography that significantly attenuates U.S. military strengths, uh, and then an asymmetry of interests as well. These areas simply matter more to our rivals than they, they do to us. And so when you put these things together, uh, it starts to raise questions about whether the United States can actually uphold its alliance obligations in a crisis uh, and whether it can, it can uphold favorable regional climates in these areas. So, so that's a second challenge. A third challenge is that the end of history is ended. Uh, and by this I mean that the, the world ideological climate is becoming more contested as well. Uh, authoritarian regimes are becoming more skillful, uh, more subtle in many ways, more tenacious in resisting liberalization. Uh, Russia and China are touting the virtues of their own authoritarian models over Western concepts of liberalism and human rights. Uh, they're opposing democratic uh, regime changes in their own neighborhoods and in places like Syria as well. Uh, there are growing questions uh, about whether democracies can deliver the goods economically and in terms of governance. Uh, and so even though democracy remains uh, highly robust by historical standards, uh, the advance of electoral democracy has largely stalled over the past decade, and there may even be a modest democratic recession underway. Uh, and so the point here is that Americans can no longer simply assume that the world ideological climate is moving inexorably in their direction. A fourth challenge uh, is that handling what we often call rogue actors, so those actors that flout the basic norms of the international order, uh, this has also become more difficult because I think these actors have become more empowered. Uh, North Korea now has a sizable nuclear arsenal and is working towards an ICBM capability. Uh, Iran is fanning sectarianism and instability in the Middle East, even as it's emerging from international sanctions. Uh, ISIL has demonstrated how non-state actors can sow chaos throughout that region while also spreading or simply inspiring terrorism across the globe. Uh, and so I would say that on balance, the, the rogues are probably stronger than at any time since 1991, since Saddam Hussein was defeated during the Persian Gulf War. Uh, and so that's another challenge. Uh, a fifth challenge has less to do with the United States than with its allies. Uh, as U.S. adversaries have been getting stronger in relative terms over the past 10, 15 years, particularly U.S. allies have been getting relatively weaker. Uh, U U.S. grand strategy has always been a coalition strategy. It's rested on our leadership of a group of like-minded and highly capable countries. Uh, but with some notable exceptions, and I would largely consider Australia to be one of these, most of our traditional allies have been losing global wealth and power, at least in relative terms, over the past decade and a half. Uh, and in Europe especially, they've just been eviscerating their defense capabilities. So uh, on aggregate, I think our allies are less capable of contributing to the common cause than they were earlier in the post-Cold War era, whether that cause is supporting out-of-area military interventions or maintaining favorable military balances, balances within Europe or East Asia. So that's a fifth challenge. And then I think the sixth challenge, and perhaps uh, the most profound, uh, arguably comes from within. Uh, if you just watch uh, CNN or you read the New York Times, you can see, I think pretty easily, that there are now real questions about whether the United States will be able to take the political steps that are needed to sustain its strategy over time. Uh, think about defense spending. Political polarization and gridlock have really just played havoc with the U.S. defense budget over the past five years. They have severely disrupted 
readiness, modernization, force structure, all at a time when U.S. primacy is already becoming more contested. Uh, the free trade aspect of American strategy is also under fire politically. Just look at the debate over TPP. Uh, and then more broadly, the current election cycle is the first time in about 45 years, since 1972, that a major party candidate has fundamentally opposed key aspects of American international engagement, as we've known it since World War II anyways. Uh, and so the domestic foundation of American grand strategy has become more uncertain. Uh, and so if the, the first and second parts of this talk were sort of meant to give you the reasons to be optimistic about American grand strategy, uh, the third part gives you all the reasons you should be worried. Uh, and in fact, when I, I think when you add all these challenges together, uh, U.S. strategy faces a more difficult panorama than at any time since the end of the Cold War. I think the challenges are more severe than they have been in some time, in many ways, at least. Uh, and they're also more numerous, which has the effect of further stretching the resources that we and our friends have available to deal with those challenges. Now, uh, I haven't given myself uh, much time to discuss what the way ahead is, but, but I will just close by saying that uh, I think that the United States, along with many of its partners, is going to be confronted with uh, sharper grand strategic dilemmas in the coming years. So over the course of the post-Cold War era, we've become somewhat accustomed to being able to pursue such an ambitious, encompassing grand strategy, essentially on the cheap, uh, because the margin of American and allied power was so comfortable, and because so many of the trends in the international environment seem to be going our way. Uh, that's no longer the case today. The international environment has become more contested, and I think this general trend is likely to continue over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, and so I think what we're likely to find is that the same level of effort, the same level of investment is likely to produce diminishing results in a grand strategic sense. Uh, and so what this means is that in the coming years uh, and decades, we're going to reach a point where we will have to make a decision. Uh, and the decision is whether we and our allies are willing to invest uh, fairly significantly more resources and effort to sustain this grand strategy. Uh, along with the post-Cold War order that it's promoted, or alternatively, alternatively whether we should start uh, accepting greater trade-offs in terms of the ambition of American strategy, in terms of what we think we can accomplish in the world. Now, uh, my preference would be for the first approach, because I think that American strategy has worked uh, fairly well over the past quarter century, uh, because the U.S. and its allies still command a share of global wealth and power that, by most historical standards, is quite impressive. And because I think that the level of marginal investment that we're talking about here is significant but not prohibitive, whether you're talking about defense spending or, or anything else. Uh, but I do acknowledge that it's an open question whether uh, our leaders in the United States and perhaps elsewhere can mobilize the domestic support necessary to make those investments. Uh, and I think that even people like me who think that America's post-Cold War grand strategy and primacy have generally been a good thing uh, have to recognize that there's likely to be some rougher sledding ahead. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and wrap up, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, I want to show ultimate temerity by challenging the chairman. Um, the chair that uh, Bob O'Neill and I both held in Oxford is, of course, a chair in the history of war, not of war. Um, and it's an important distinction that... Well, it did, Bob, that's true. That's true, I won't dispute that. But, but I think the, the, um, the distinction is important because, at least for me, I'm definitely a historian. The fact that I now, now hold a chair in international relations shows that even in old age there can be life um, and that you can con some of the people some of the time. Uh, or at least not you lot, but I'm probably con St Andrews. Um, my, I say that because my job today is to address lessons from the golden age. And it's so, it's to, it, I'm being asked to project into the future from the past. Um, part of my problem is that I'm not terribly sure when the golden age was. Um, I looked at that those concentric circles over there, saw what I presume is Sun Tzu, uh, though whether he was a he or a they is an open question, uh, and certainly it must be an open question like any portrait of Homer uh, as to whether it's a true likeness. Um, the other chap you will recognize, because it's the only likeness we have of him, um, Karl von Clausewitz. I'm not going to mention Sun Tzu again. He hasn't been mentioned so far in the conference. Klaus Witz has been mentioned so far in the conference, and I will mention him again. Is the action of the golden age we're talking about really, of course, the true golden age, 1966, because that was the year 
of SDSC, whose birthday we're here to celebrate. I assume that is what we're all meant to take for granted. Uh, it's unusual because most adults can't remember when they were robust infants on their birth. SDSC clearly can remember when it was a, uh, a, a, a healthy infant, or what proved to be a healthy infant. Um, and I'm going to assume that what I'm meant to be addressing is the period between 1966 and the publication of New Directions of Strategy. In other words, what we might call, call the sort of middle to late Cold War era. The second question of definition, and, and Elliot's already raised this, is what are strategic studies? And actually the question that Evelyn asked went to the heart of this, you know, is it a matter of policy direction? Is it a matter of scholarship? Um, are we engaged in something that is and should be a policy relevant activity? And I think, you know, this question is going to come up again later today. Um, a, a pragmatic business which is located in the present and is orientated towards the future, which is, uh, to quote something I think Chris Barry said in the previous session about shaping good outcomes, or are we addressing strategic thought? And for me, strategic thought, and actually even more for Clausewitz, I hesitate to put myself in the same category, uh, but that just shows how conditioned I am by reading his book. Um, it is a matter, strategic thought, above all about a dialogue between the present and the past rather than about the present and the future. After all, the raw material that Clausewitz was addressing in On War was the outcome uh, of his experience of war, the experiential quality of that, and his relationship uh, of that to the immediate past of his father and maybe of his grandfather. I mean, in other words, back to the era of Frederick the Great, the military history of the last 60 or 70 years. Clausewitz deliberately refused to speculate about the future, except on one occasion, where effectively he said, we can't do it. Um, he wrote far more military history in his life than he ever wrote military theory, and he assumed that current experience would only be given theoretical force by comparing it with the past so as to establish what he regarded as generally true as opposed to things which might simply be unique uh, or peculiar phenomena uh, rather than generally applicable phenomena. So what does that approach, if you like, Clausewitz's approach, tell us about the golden age uh, that we're looking back to, the second half of the, uh, the Cold War? I want to make three points uh, in answer to that question. Two I'll put in relatively simplified and abbreviated fashion, and the other, the third, I want to develop more fully, uh, assuming I allow myself time. The first point is that Clausewitz's understanding of strategic studies had the study of war and war's conduct at its heart. The overwhelming focus of strategic studies in the late Cold War, and we've had this reflected in much of the earlier discussion, was about war's avoidance. Now, of course, that's a gross oversimplification, especially given the fact that in the Golden Age, as far as SDSC was concerned, Australia went to war in Vietnam with profound uh, national consequences, and indeed for Bob O'Neill, personal consequences. But by 1966, Bernard Brodie's Damascene conversion of 7th of August 1945, I'm sure you all know the story that he was driving with his wife, um, on the 7th of August 1945 and he jumped out of the car and he bought a copy of the New York Times and he read of the news of the dropping of the first atomic bomb and he said to her, allegedly, everything I have ever written, what he'd written was largely on maritime strategy, uh, is obsolete. Thus far, he went on, the chief purpose of our military establishment has been to win wars. From now on, its chief purpose must be to avert them. And so deterrence was the dominant theme of 1966. In 2016, if you think about our discussions today, deterrence may be a theme, but it's become a sub-theme. Uh, much more evident has been our discussion once again of war itself. We haven't always called it war. We might give it other guises, but we are talking about the use of violence uh, in human relationships. Uh, and we have to be discussing, and we increasingly do discuss, I think, 
uh, what is a war, when is a war, when is this a war and not a war, uh, is the global war on terror and so on. We've actually had to engage once again with what war means. The debates of the 1960s were not silent on those questions, but they were not centre stage. So my first point is this, war is back. We may give it another title, we may call it armed conflict, we may call it all sorts of other things, and that's one of the reasons why strategic studies are back and not security studies, if you like, okay, to go back to a question that Elliot raised. Uh, that strategy is centrally concerned with the business of war, um, and if we think war is important, then we probably need to address strategy. Second point, uh, and this was also adumbrated in the last session, history is back. Now, of course, history never went too far away in the Cold War. But Brody's principal point in 1945, and the point that he wanted to get over when uh, his book on the absolute weapon was published in 1946, was that his earlier work, just to remind you of his phrase, had been rendered obsolete. Other disciplines ousted history from its primacy in the study of strategy. Um, I was struck by Peter Ho's use of the phrase, the acceleration of history, um, in the last session because what it called to mind was a phrase Laurie Martin, Laurie Friedman's pre uh, predecessor at, at King's London, Lawrence Martin, used in, I think, 1980, when he talked about the deceleration of history, um, by which he meant, of course, the sense of permanence which the bipolar system uh, and the adoption of nuclear weapons and through that, uh, the embracing of deterrence, had given to the appearance of international relations. Um, today, we would describe strategic studies, and it has been described, and I think rightly described, and it's a much better subject for it, as multidisciplinary. I'm not for a moment saying history has to resume its position of primacy. But what I am concerned to do is to engage with the question of whether history is just about hindsight, whether somehow it becomes a form of imprisonment which makes us less able to respond to contingency, to change, and to the unexpected because that is the usual accusation, and we've heard it today, that is leveled against it. History did not go away, but it was abused more than it was used by the Strategic Studies fraternity. Uh, and it was used, and is still used, in ways that historians, fully paid up historians, which I would claim to be one, self-evidently, would simply not recognize. And let me give you three examples of that. The first, is the trend in departments of politics and political science, especially in the United States, uh, to reject history, to struggle to accept the place of history, or to discuss it as anything other than storytelling. Um, the best uh, that it can do, can, it seems to be, is to provide a basis for a case study, uh, and the shaping of that case study is determined not by context, by historical context, and much more by a set of theoretical assumptions which then rob history of its context and seem to be impervious to contradictory evidence. As a First World War historian, I say this with considerable passion. Uh, if you read any IR discussion of the origins of the First World War, it is locked in the legacy of the 1960s and its literature. And I have to say, um, it's, uh, the, the, it's not just that Germany still caused the First World War in a way that Fritz Fischer would have argued, uh, it is also that it broke out because of something called the cult of the offensive. Um, and I find that offensive. Uh, because I think it simply fails to understand the debates that are going on in military thought before 1914. I haven't got time to explain that, just take it from me, I'm right and they're wrong. <laughs> uh, in other words, the use of history has got locked in the golden age of the 60s and 70s. The second point is that even those departments that are open to history uh, and the use of history treat history as telling you something that is continuous and unchanging. Quite frankly, this is not what historians do. I'm fond of quoting, I'm going to quote him again, the example of Marc Bloch, uh, the great French medieval economic historian, the, uh, essentially the founder of the Annales School, the man who was in entirely concerned with the long durée but who reflected on his own experience as a French officer in the First World War and as a French officer again in May 1940. Um, and when he was fighting as a French Jew in the resistance movement 
Uh, before his execution by the Gestapo in 1944, he wrote a book called Strange Defeat. And the middle of that book, there is a discussion why the French army had performed so badly in May 1940, having done so well in 1914. And his response to that was the way the Ecole de Guerre had treated history. It had treated history as the study of cont continuity. It had gone back to Napoleonic precept rather than to study of change. History, uh, Bloch averted, uh, asserted absolutely rightly, is concerned with understanding change over time. Uh, why do we become obsessive with the outbreak of the First World War? Because it was self-evidently a turning point. Just as 1789 was a turning point, or 1939 was a turning point, or the end of the Cold War was a turning point. And the third problem is this, that history in the late Cold War found its niche less in strategic thought and more in operational thought and in thinking about so-called conventional war. When I lectured at Santos in the late 1970s, my job was to give the one so-called history lecture, uh, and that was on the Russo-German front between 1943 and 1945, because that was meant to tell the British Army of the 1980s how it was going to deal with the Soviet attack on the inner German border. Um, and of course, as the arguments about the operational level of war took hold, particularly in the United States, uh, then what were they concerned with? They were concerned with uh, the May 1940 attack that had concerned Mark Bloch because it was a model, of course, of how to do the operational level of war. Um, and then others, of course, looked back before that to Tukhachevsky, deep attack in the Soviet army. Uh, what it was, in other words, was another use of the argument about continuity. And as actual war climbed back up the agenda after the end of the Cold War, as armies found themselves concerned with how they would operate, uh, and Laurie Friedman's reference yesterday to the Iraq war and its importance uh, is central here, then of course they went back very often to exactly those sort of arguments. And that trend has increased since then, not diminished. Let me just give you two quotations. Jim Mattis, writing the Joint Forces Quarterly in 2008 when he attacked effects-based operations, to quote, we must return to time-honored principles and terminology that our forces have tested in the crucible of battle and that are well grounded in the theory and nature of war. It's an argument about continuity and about history. General Vincent Desport, uh, who ran both the Ecole de Guerre and the French Doctrine Center when the two were co-located, writing in exactly the same year, war is war. For centuries, we have had the feeling that we are fighting new wars unrelated to previous conflicts. But with the benefit of hindsight, it is surprising to see the stability of the general characteristic of conflicts, their unchanging logic, and the error that could have been avoided if the trendsetters of the period had simply had longer memories. The rediscovery of counterinsurgency in 2006, or thereabouts, that is of course the, the year of the publication of the US Field Manual 3-24, used history in exactly that way. The cherry picking, of Algeria, Malaya, and so on, in ways that suited the themes that the doctrine was developing, but bore no relationship to the historical context within which they were set. The ultimate absurdity, of course, was the figure of T.E. Lawrence, uh, an insurgent leader who suddenly became an example for counterinsurgency thinking, uh, thus showing exactly how counterinsurgency thought was being devoid, uh, stripped out of its political context. Um, it was, in other words, not a substitute for strategic, or it became a substitute for strategic thought uh, in the years between 2002 and 2014. Uh, and we look back, if you like, from tw in 2016 on a decade and a half characterized by constant reports of operational progress and operational success, measured in all sorts of ways, um, but no strategic least satisfactory outcome in Iraq, Afghanistan, or Libya, partly because we haven't been engaging with strategies we've done so. The essential point here is not that history has no part to play in strategic studies, but we must stop abusing history and how we use it. Indeed, the re-emergence of war since 1990 increases the value of history precisely because it should enhance our understanding of war at the operational, uh, sorry, at the experiential level. Can't read my own writing as usual. Uh, the function of history for strategic studies is to encourage understanding, not to stress continuity.
to realize what is changing through our understanding of change. So let me come to my third point, which is essentially one to illustrate that argument, the place of democracy in strategy. Elliot Cohen just now gave us a wonderful, broad understanding of who our audience might be if we study strategy. And it was a pretty eclectic um, and uh, wide-ranging bunch. But what concerns me here is it's still a pretty much defined as an elite activity. It is a job for those of us in this room, members of armed forces, statesmen, academics even. Um, it is for us to debate strategic studies in universities and think tanks in order for generals uh, to use as a basis for discussion with politicians and for statesmen then to reach decisions. The fact that we exclude the wider electorate, despite the fact that we are democracies, is, I would argue, a product in part of the golden age, but it is now a legacy which leaves us confused and vulnerable. And I said I'd mentioned Clausewitz, and I'm going to do it again, so look at him again, just uh, doff your cap for a moment. When Clausewitz addressed strategy uh, in the so-called Trinity, that vexed passage at the end of Book 1, Chapter 1, of course he defined the uh, Trinity in terms of reason, the play of probability, and chance and passion. I don't need to tell you lot all this. And then he went on to relate those to what his uh, uh, strategic studies people and I call the secondary trinity, which were the government, the armed forces, and the people. In the era that Clausewitz saw the beginning of, the era of war after the French Revolution, uh, and up until 1945, the growing dominance of the mass army made popular participation in war self-evident. And indeed, it was Clausewitz's departure point. It's worth remembering that he described absolute war not just as theory, but in Book 8 he said, we would believe it was theory had we not seen it in our own times. Had we not seen the effect of the revolution in mobilizing people for war, in making uh, the wider nation part of the war effort. Um, and that trend was reflected and reinforced by the processes of industrialization, which made the civilian, well, factory employee, I've got to be very quick, I knew I'd run out of time, uh, made the civilian employee a fundamental part in the waging of war and of strategy in both the world wars. In those world wars, the civilian became a target, but also a participant. The purpose of blockade in the First World War was to facilitate the revolution of the German people against the German government. And indeed, revolution was used in a wider sense across the Ottoman Empire by the British um, and across uh, the Russian Empire uh, by the Germans when, of course, they smuggled Lenin in. I could elaborate on the example. In the past, the hope had been to curb revolution and to prevent revolution leading to war. Now that relationship was inverted. During the Cold War, the role of the people in making strategy became passive. They were the hostages of nuclear deterrence. Their lives were the price to be paid if there was a devastating counter-city strike. Democracy for revolutionary France have been a means of mobilization for war. Nuclear weapons demobilized the democracies uh, and demobilized the democratic strengths of Western governments in three ways. First of all, because they permitted, I've got to shut up, permitted, I'm going to try and get into these three points, <laughs> permitted the end of the mass army. Secondly, because they were presented as a cheap option so that taxation, rather than being a war tax, which it had been in the 19th century, taxation essentially became focused on health, social services, and so on. And indeed, the argument in 2003 was effectively war could be waged without the major democracies confronting the costs of doing so by increased taxation. And thirdly, nuclear weapons promised short, sudden war with no need to mobilize the nation. My essential point, which I haven't got time to develop, and I'm happy to develop if you want to come back to me, 
is the challenge we confront today is the challenge of engaging our wider societies and the nation as a whole in terms of what we understand strategy. Because at the moment we confront a disconnect between the sort of discussions we are having and wider pu public participation. A disconnect exacerbated by the tendencies of our leaders to use the vocabulary of the Second World War, to hype the threat, to oversell what they tend to do, and then underdeliver a response which tends to produce cynicism rather than the reverse. The way through this thicket of late has been, of course, the use of drones, special forces, and so on, uh, as an operational solution to that problem, but one which itself does not address the need for democratic engagement within our own people. Uh, and that seems to me exactly uh, the lesson that we need to draw, uh, that we need to embrace strategies which allow the participation of the people in what we are trying to do, because without that there will remain a democratic deficit in strategy. Well, it's a tough uh, challenge to go after Hugh Strong and before Bob O'Neill. Uh, so it is pretty intimidating. Uh, I have been asked to talk on the topic, an Asian school of strategic studies with a question mark. And my first reaction when I saw this topic, an email from Brendan, was that here we go again. ANU is setting up another school. Uh, <laughs> Those who are from ANU will know what I'm talking about. Uh, but then it dawned on me that actually I've been asked to talk about a, a distinctive uh, Asian approach uh, to issues of strategy and uh, security. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to give any advice on whether ANU will set up another school or restructure the existing schools. All right. I'm glad that there is a question mark after this uh, topic because uh, uh, I have serious doubts about whether an Asian school is possible or even desirable. But I think it's a very useful question, uh, and I'm glad that Brendan posed it that way, because it allows us to reflect on what are the challenges and what are the possibilities of creating, uh, not even creating, what are the challenges and possibilities of strategic studies in Asia, or Asia Pacific, or Indo Pacific, whatever may be the trend today. And, uh, I want to raise five points. The first three of them are not insurmountable. They're also well known. But the last two are really critical. But let me mention the first three points because they are important as well. But the answer to the first three depends on the answer to the last two. First, which region? Well, where and what is Asia? We all know Asia is not a fixed notion. It's a region of immense diversity. Regional naming keeps changing, like a fashion statement. In the first three decades, we have seen the rise and fall of Asia Pacific, or East Asia, and now the trend of the day, what is trending today is the Indo-Pacific, at least in Australia. So regional naming is a very political affairs, but affair, but it also has academic connotations. What uh, an Asian school should or should not study, who should belong or shouldn't belong. And it's very interesting that uh, Sira Jamohan was one of our first speakers today. When I came to SDSC in 1983, my first visit, uh, I can imagine a uh, strategic studies conference being opened, uh, the first speaker being from India. India was not seen as part of Asia Pacific in those days. So, so, so I think this is important uh, to keep in mind which region are we covering uh, if we are going to think of a school of strategic studies. Second, and this is mentioned by Elliot, uh, I, the strategic studies or security studies. I thought this debate had been settled, but I, wouldn't, I hadn't counted on Elliot Cohen being here and uh, reviving. We had so much debate on this in the 1990s and uh, 2000s. Uh, and we know so strategic studies traditionally understood is the use or threat of use of military force. Security is a more broader notion. It includes non-traditional security or human security. And strategic studies 
is often criticized for being too narrow, and security studies is often seen as being too broad. Uh, but the problem is, if you want to think of a strategic study school in Asia, it's pretty hard not to take the broader view of security. Because security in this region is always understood as comprehensive security. It's a long tradition of thinking of security. In fact, there are very few, few places in Asia where you can really do strategic studies in the classic sense of the term. Uh, so, so, and in, in this case, I'm actually uh, with Peter Ho and against Elliot Cohen. I think you need to have security in the broad sense. This is, this is, the, this is the region, this is the tradition, this is the cognitive prior of this region. And uh, this is what uh, uh, we try to do in the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies, named as Defense and Strategic Studies, but a lot of it was security. The leading programs there, I was the head of research for the first seven years, uh, was uh, regionalism, multilateralism, security architecture, non-traditional security, and, and we also studied uh, war and peace. And Peter Ho funded all of that. Third, who is to lead or anchor an Asian school? Well. SDSC. It is without question, and I'm not saying that because I'm here at the 50th anniversary of uh, SDSC, but uh, without question, this is the place that has been the leader, intellectual leader, for strategic studies in Asia. Many of us have passed through SDSC at different points, whether full time or part time, as full, our visitors. But can we think of SDSC providing that leadership today? in the 21st century, in the rise of Asia, it will be politically problematic. It will also be seen, fairly or unfairly, as a threat to localization and indigenization of scholarship, or the need for more local Asian voices and scholarship. But then, are there really institutions or uh, in Asia that can that are up to this task? I'm not so sure. I have uh, lived and worked in Asia and the West, I think approximately half of, in each uh, uh, of the two. I have uh, been the founding president of the Asian Political and International Studies Association, the founded secretary general of a consortium for Asian consortium of non-traditional security, and the president of the Global International Studies Association. I don't think there is an SDAC anywhere in Asia. Sorry to say this. That is not to say that there aren't strategic thinkers or traditions in Asia, which are absolutely brilliant. But the combination of intellectual depth, policy relevance, and academic independence, that, that combination is not there in any institution in Asia. India comes closer, but lack of resources is a huge problem there. And there is also different types of politics. So it is actually revealing that some of the best strategic study scholars from Asia are not working in Asia. They're working in United States, UK, and right here in Australia. And this is not because simply lack of resources. It's also because of lack of permissive conditions, academic freedom. So these three questions are important. But they're not as in, in, important, or answers to them depends on the last two questions I'm going to raise, which I think are absolutely crucial. So this leads me to the fourth point. What a school needs a core thematic focus, a set of generalizable concepts and methods. So we have two examples. One is an example in international relations broadly, which subsumes strategic studies. That's the English school of uh, international relations. The other one is the Copenhagen school. The English school uh, developed the idea of society of states and a whole range of concepts such as uh, solidarity and pluralism and order versus justice, Hadley Bull, Adam Watson, and there are people here who have been trained in English school. The Copenhagen school developed this idea of securitization and desecuritization. Sounds like a mouthful, but uh, there's a long tradition of, uh, now there is a huge literature on the Copenhagen school. So what would be the comparable focus for a nation school? Would it be strategic culture? Well, I'm reminded of a very important article by Des Ball in 1993 in Security Studies, which many of you might have read. It's called Strategic Culture in the Asia-Pacific Region. 
And in that article, Des identified certain distinctive aspects of strategic culture in Asia or Asia Pacific. And some of them are an Asian way of war, which had less emphasis on holding territory than exercising other forms of uh, indirect forms of military, economic, and cultural influence, or even hegemony. Informality of policy making, structures, and processes, consensus over majority rule, pragmatism over idealism, and a comprehensive approach to security. He had many other categories, but these are the important ones. But putting culture at the heart of strategic studies brings back bad memories, like Asian values, Asian concept of human rights. These were criticized not only as a justification for authoritarianism, but also for going too far in cultural particularism and exceptionalism. And that's not a good basis for developing a strategic study school. To be sure, each country and each region is distinctive. All theories and schools of IR, whether in international relations or strategic studies, reflect a certain national or regional context. It's true of America, it's true of United, uh, Europe, everywhere. But they must do more than just that, reflect a certain national or regional context. So I have a simple test for any regional or national school to be effective or to be credible. That school must explain not just what happens in that country or the region, it must also generate ideas that can travel beyond that country and the region and have some universal applicability. Look at the English school. Yeah, some of us are a little skeptical of the English school, or cynical, I'd say it's probably a way of a nostalgia about Britain's lost empire and its allegedly benevolent contribution to creating an international society, all but based on European rules. Uh, the Copenhagen School, we can think of securitization theory as uh, reflecting continental Europe's uh, intellectual traditions, whether it's post-structuralism or discourse analysis. But English school can be usefully applied to Asia or everywhere else in the world. It has concepts and theories that can travel. So can be Copenhagen School. In fact, when we build a non-traditional security pro uh, program in, Asia, in, in Singapore, we use Copenhagen School as the starting point. So what theories from Asia can travel like that? The closest attempt to create an Asia school, it's not a regional school, but maybe a sub-regional or national school, is the Chinese school of IR. Many of you know about this. The Chinese are most advanced in creating their own school of IR. And it's very interesting. But does it pass my test? The Chinese school of IR is mostly drawing from Chinese worldview and practice for the past, present, or future. And a good deal of it, not if not all, seems like a legitimization of Chinese official foreign policy ideology whether it's the Tianxia all under heaven or the peaceful rise of China. It is yet to offer a set of concepts and approaches that can travel beyond China or East Asia, which can be used to study international relations or strategy in other regions or at the global level. And my last challenge to an Asian school of strategic studies is the most important one. And I call it the Hedley Bull test. Why? Because this was contained in an essay that Hedley Bull wrote in Australian Outlook, now called Australian Journal of International Affairs, in 1972. And Nick Bisley, the editor is here, is now freely available until the end of this year. You should read it. It's titled International Relations as an Academic Pursuit. And Bull, and uh, I'm using that, uh, included strategic studies as a subfield of international relations. Some of you may disagree with that, but strategic studies, hopefully, is a subfield. And so what he talks about international relations applies to study of strategy and defense. And he actually mentions that. So let me quote from one passage from Bo. I quote, the academic international relations specialist should not be a servant or agent of his government. There is a need on both sides for exchange of ideas and mutual criticism between academics and officials in the field of foreign policy and defense. But inquiry into international relations is a different activity from running the foreign policy of a country and necessarily classes 
with it, unquote. This may be going a little too far. I'm more sympathetic to uh, you know, the cross-fertilization between academia and policy. But Bull is not opposed to it either. So let me read to another little paragraph from that article. And I quote, international relations specialists in universities and in governments should talk to each other, but should remain themselves. Let me emphasize, should remain themselves. It is only if they remain themselves that academic students of international relations are likely to have anything distinctive to contribute to the discussion of foreign policy problems, unquote. Now, strategic studies everywhere is policy driven and enjoys close proximity to the government, whether it's in the West or in Asia, everywhere. And uh, nothing new. But in the West, governments change. So if you are in the government today, it will be a critique tomorrow. In Asia, governments don't change very much. So you remain basically reinforcing the same set of ideas, and, or if you tend to be a critique, you lose your access to the government, uh, resources of the government, or support of the government. So I have added a corollary to the Hadley Bull test. In an article in the International Studies Review in 2011, entitled Engagement or Entrapment, Scholarship and Policymaking in Asian Regionalism, I developed this idea of uh, entrapment. What is entrapment? It happens when academic specialists of international relations or strategic studies, after making contribution to policy and enjoying or after securing proximity to the policymakers and earning their trust, become trapped, beholden to the official line and find it very difficult to get out of that to independently criticize the government position or take an independent policy. And it happens a lot in Asia. Why it happens? Because the primary stakeholders and consumers of strategic studies knowledge in Asia are governments and not the academic community or the civil society. In fact, strategic studies in Asia is dominated not by universities, but by think tanks, including some think tanks placed in universities that are closely tied to governments. Many strategic studies think tanks are extensions of defense and foreign ministries, directly funded or run by government officials or retired officials. University-based or genuinely independent research centers and strategic studies in Asia are rather few and far between. One consequence of this is that uh, there's a discouragement of high quality theoretical or conceptual work. Theoretical or conceptual work is not valued. The incentive structure is not there. But without some conceptual theoretical work, you can't have a school of strategic studies. You can still be very useful, but a school of strategic studies needs some concepts and, and the ideas. Also, a key function of strategic studies think tanks in Asia is the so-called track two. As Professor Stuart Harris from ANU once wrote in an article in Pacific Review in 1994, Track two dialogues in Asia are dependent, and I quote, upon the consent, endorsement, and commitment, often including financial commitment of governments. Now, as a consequence, non-conforming social movements or independent academics are often excluded from those dialogues. Another problem is the generalist rule rather than specialist. So even on the, I've been to meetings on maritime security where the expertise is not run by, or the meetings are not run by maritime experts, but general IR scholars or, or specialists and international relations more generally. And there is generational gatekeeping, very, uh, a, a failure to bring in new blood on a continuous basis. So as a result, track to dialogues in Asia are unable to rise above national interests or present alternative understandings of strategy or foreign policy. They remain beholden to the trap of nationalism, state sovereignty, and non-intervention. So what is to be done, if anything? I think instead of an Asian school, I would call for more networking, especially among universities and think tanks in Asia or Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific, with a view to exchange ideas, information, and solutions to common problems. This can be done at multiple levels. Track two is useful. I mean, Des Ball and I participated jointly in many track activities. We even developed the idea of preventive diplomacy. We did a book together 
and that becomes the standard text for preventive diplomacy for ASEAN Regional Forum. I do not disparage that work, but that's not enough. You can't build an Asian school of strategic studies on track two. You also need at the level of graduate students. So Evelyn Go here is developing a graduate students network in Asia Pacific security. That's very important to catch them early. And uh, I'm happy to be part of it. A really good model is uh, in, Ca in Canada, we should have something called CANCAPS, and I was a professor in Canada, called Canadian Consortium for Asia Pacific Security. This is uh, now defunct uh, because of the Harper government, maybe revived now. But the idea was that you will have a discussion, annual meeting, and it moves from university to university. The president is elected every year. Anybody can come in as long as you register, but government officials participate with enthusiasm in droves. And you got really fruitful interaction between government officials and academics, but it's laid by academics. So it is also important to develop some core themes. And I would think that for Asia, the two areas that are very important, one is non-traditional security. It kind of bridges the divide between the traditional strategic studies and the more expansive notion of security studies. And uh, another area where it's seriously lacking in Asia is conflict resolution of uh, negotiations, which is a tradition in nor uh, Northern Europe uh, and other parts of the world. But in Asia, I can't think of really an institution that really seriously trains people in conflict resolution and uh, negotiations. It's also important to have historical and theoretical research, at least theoretical framing. And to quote Hadley Bull again, the test for an academic contribution to international relations that it should have either historical or theoretical depth. Academic work which consists simply of the retelling of information about international affairs or ad hoc comment or policy polemic does not meet that test, unquote. Finally, strategic studies institutions and scholars should engage in genuine policy debates and explore alternative ways of promoting security. One of the problems with think tanks, strategic studies think tanks in Asia is that their main role is providing background information, not doing policy debates the way we do that in uh, Washington, D.C. That's probably too much of it in Washington, D.C. and too little of it in Asia. So you can get a lot of policy papers, but they only tell you this is the background to a conflict. Uh, this, this is what different people say. But saying that this is policy A and this is policy B and we shouldn't do A, but we should do B or C, very rarely happens. It happens in some countries, but the vast majority of Asian countries, this sort of policy debate and alternative framing of policy doesn't happen, and that really needs to happen. happen. So if strategic studies in Asia is to have some credibility, even as a policy-oriented enterprise, it should really have provide a platform for alternatives and debates. So those are my five points, and I'd be happy to take your questions, and my time is up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may I thank Brendan for the opportunity of speaking to you this morning. Brendan, this has been a great conference, uh, and I've felt for you during <clears throat> the last couple of days, having run a few conferences myself in the past, it's a little bit like setting out to build Sydney Harbour Bridge. You've got a whole lot of big, heavy things that you have to lock into place, and you have to design the thing carefully so that the final structure is worth much more than the sum of its individual parts. And Brendan, I think you've achieved that with uh, this program, this team of speakers, and, and the way the uh, discussion has gone. It's going to make a very good book, and I look forward to reading it next year or whenever it, it comes out. Now, I've been given the task of addressing the next golden age in strategic studies. And that means I'd better find one. Uh, with, uh, as I look out, out there, I'm very caught by Peter Ho's uh, metaphor of the black elephants. You know, am I seeing a herd of black elephants out there? I think, uh, I, think I can part some of them and there are some little golden specks of light 
there. What am I looking for? What is a golden age? It's one which results in the production of fruitful wisdom. I place emphasis on that word fruitful. There is an awful lot of wisdom thought up uh, by analysts and think tankers and government staffers uh, and army staff colleges and, and so on. But whether it results in something that you can actually use successfully uh, is, I think, the, the big determining factor. And if you ask me to give you an example of a golden age in strategic studies, I would say the 1980s, because this was the time when the, uh, the SALT, SALT 1 and SALT 2 had settled into place and were seen to be working, and we were then able to move on to the INF agreement. They took a huge amount of tension and uncertainty out of the air and I think have helped us get through the past 30 years without any use of nuclear weapons. Um, let's hope that the coming decade is another golden age because there are some uh, very tough challenges coming up and let me speak to a few of them. I have to say sorry to Frank Fukuyama because this is certainly not the end of history. History is changing as we, as we go through it. Um, we are very unlikely to see a World War I scenario again where everything is tightly controlled by national governments, almost uh, dictatorial regimes Hundreds of thousands of, of young men dash out of their homes with their packs on the back and their rifle and board a train to go three or four hundred miles and then fight a series of ghastly battles which results uh, in, in their deaths. We're, we're not going to repeat that kind of, of situation again. Um, <coughs> even the Second World War type of mobilization and control I think is going to be very unlikely. We are moving into an era where power is being distributed in different ways in our, our national societies and in our global society. Uh, Hugh, you mentioned uh, the importance of looking at democracy in, this, in the process of generating strategic policy and I think that that uh, is a very important new factor. Our societies are changing uh, and of course as they change technology changes and with everything being much more societally driven at lower levels we have this hideous little instrument that anyone can run around with and organize their own miniature civil war out of, and they've been doing it in recent weeks. Let me just list some of the major challenges that I think we will have to address. The first is that of the jihadis. I use jihadi deliberately rather than terrorist because jihadis are much more serious people. Uh, they are out to kill. They like killing. They think we should be dead and they don't mind if they die in the process. It's all part of the exhilaration of life. And now that this uh, spark has been released into the international haystack, we're going to have to take it very seriously indeed and upgrade our, <coughs> our methods for dealing with it, in, including drawing in allies from the Islamic community who have as much to fear from these jihadis as we do, if, if not more. But it's a, a tough issue. The second is the uncontrolled flow of refugees. Uh, if you have been looking at the Mediterranean over the past five years, it has just been tragic to see the number of pe people starving, badly governed, coming north out of Africa, looking desperately for somewhere safe to be and, and they see Europe. There will be other refugee flows in other parts of the world, but that one 
uh, is, I think, going to remain very important and tough to deal with. Uh, it's not just a matter of stop the boats. You have to do something about stopping people at the source. You have to give them better government. They have to develop this themselves. There are plenty of knowledgeable, willing people to do it, but they need resources and they need encouragement, and that's going to be another big role for us in the future. We have talked about China uh, in the past day and a half, and so we should have. Uh, it's a wholly new factor on the scene. We need to cast our minds back about 500 years uh, before we come across a China that's like the China of the 21st century. China in the Middle Ages was the great power. Uh, it was not terribly aggressive because it had so much within its own borders, but it demanded respect. Uh, and it did poke its nose into other parts of the world. Its naval expeditions are, are famous. China today is going to be curious about how far the limits of its uh, sovereignty go, and this is all being tested in the uh, Western Pacific as I speak. It's going to be a very tough problem. Uh, I don't think it's insoluble. My experience of dealing with Chinese is that there are a lot of very reasonable people there as well as some potential fanatics. And let's not forget, we kicked China around very badly in the 19th century. Just think back to the Opium Wars where Great Britain comes along and says, you won't take my opium? Well hell, I'm going to send the Royal Navy and blast you to bits so that you have no structure of authority to prevent us sending you our opium. And, and look how China uh, just disintegrated through the, the 19th century. It's taken China a long time to get back on its feet, but they haven't forgotten any of that. They're going to be very proud nationally. They're going to be difficult to deal with. We're going to have to show uh, a lot of understanding and discretion to be able to get through the next generation without some conflict with China. And also we're going to be dealing with an uncomfortable Russia. Uh, Paul Dibb has pointed out uh, its uh, continuing military strength uh, and the proclivities of its leadership. One of the great joys of retirement is that you get to read all kinds of things that you wish you had known about when you were teaching subjects. I've been reading a lot about Central Asia over the past couple of years. And you know, every couple of hundred years, some terrible bunch of people have come out of the east and they've gone right through this area. I mean, when you look at the structure uh, of Siberia, geographically, Paul, covered with beautiful grass that horses can be fed off, enough people riding enough horses discover that a saddle is a useful thing to have on a horse. You can go much longer distances, you can go much faster. And by Jove, once you're on the saddle, stirrups are a great idea. You can control the horse. And once you get the horse with bridle, saddle and stirrups, you look around and think, hell, this strong animal could pull something. And then you get to the chariot. And by the time you get to the chariots, you're up to the Pechenegs and the Magyars uh, and, and the Mongols. Just think of Russians sitting in this invasion corridor for a couple of thousand years. When these conquerors come through, they're not bringing human rights and uh, stre strengthening uh, lo local uh, means of improving the life of people. You know, they are enslaving the women and children, they're killing the men, uh, they're burning the towns and houses and, and so on. Off they go. Now, the Russians have grown up in that climate uh, of fear uh, for a couple of thousand years, if not more. It's no wonder they are paranoid about their security. And that's going to continue to make them difficult to live with. Managing Russia will be a huge problem. Ch climate change 
continuing. Uh, there are climate change deniers around and uh, I have a lot of fun crossing swords with them sometimes uh, because I, I'm very powerfully influenced by the, the arguments that climate control, climate change is, is going on. And we're going to see uh, massive floods in places like Bangladesh that again will generate hundreds of thousands if not millions of refugees which will spill over into other countries. Population growth is going on all the time and this is putting pressure on food and, and resources. And we shouldn't think we're immune from this problem either. Just look a little bit north across the Torres Strait and we have Papua New Guinea. When I first got to know Papua New Guinea in the early 1970s, it had four million people. Now it has nine million people and it gets a whole lot less rain than it did uh, in the 1970s. People are getting very hungry. They're mainly subsistence farmers. Papua New Guinea is verging towards ungovernability. Um, we should prepare ourselves for there to be an uncontrolled outflow of people uh, from our nearest neighbour to the north. And where are they going to come? Well, it's only a few miles across the Torres Strait. That's just one local example. Nuclear proliferation. Now, OK, uh, I accept that it's occurred much more slowly than people thought it, it might have in the 60s and, and 70s, but it is still going on. We have not found a way to row the boat back. Uh, and the more countries have nuclear weapons, the more incentive there is for other countries slowly to acquire them. What I worry about most particularly coming from nuclear proliferation is the connection with jihadis. It only needs someone to slip a particular type uh, of nuclear device. It doesn't have to be a, a, a big super bomb, just a, a dirty weapon and give it to half a dozen people who take it across the Atlantic, land on the Gaspe Peninsula uh, on the southern side of the Lawrence River there. There aren't many uh, customs guards along there. Have someone waiting with an SUV, you drive down across the United States border through forests, and I know from what I've talked, or what I've heard from United States border control officials, they can't guarantee that that border is uncrossable, and it ends up uh, in the southern part of Manhattan, and what have you got? Uh, we need to take nuclear proliferation also very seriously. We have talked a little bit about alliances and they're becoming dysfunctional. Uh, I think if we're sensible, we can uh, keep our alliance structures together in a fruitful, stable way, but it will take a lot of hard work and, and study. We've also talked a bit about cyber crime, cyber warfare, information warfare, etc. Okay, well, there are the there are the challenges. We should get a great golden age out of all those challenges if we, if we can meet a few of them. Who are the people who are going to be involved? There are five groups. Independent <coughs> institutions, that is think tanks like the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. Government experts uh, in uh, defence departments, foreign affairs departments. Uh, Prime Minister's departments, etc., intelligence organisations, there are plenty of them. Military specialists who have tended to be a bit sotto voce in the international strategic policy debate over the years. They've uh, stuck very much to their operational last. And that has resulted in some severe misunderstandings. Uh, for for those of you who haven't read it, I commend H.R. McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, which really um, says that the United, senior United States military were derelict in that they did not convince the Johnson administration 
that what they were trying to do in Vietnam was just unrealistic. And I suspect there has been a certain amount of that problem uh, behind uh, American difficulties in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've got, to, we've got to make military people more confident, more articulate, better informed, uh, and at the same time get them used to the cut and thrust of debate with people who are not wearing uniform. The fourth group are the people who are responsible for managing it all, namely the politicians. There is a huge problem in this area because as the Second World War gets further and further away and the Vietnam War, there are almost no members of parliament with military service. So they don't feel confident in relating to the military. They don't know how to. They don't know the sort of questions to ask. They come along on field exercises and poke around uh, and ask stupid questions and make inane remarks because they don't know any better. Um, my experience of dealing with politicians is that if you offer them a chance to get educated in this field, a lot of them will take it. And I think this is going to be another important challenge for the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre uh, in years to come. The fifth group are the independent writers and journalists and uh, I don't need to say anything more about uh, how important they are in connecting us with the democratic base that our societies run. We need to have better functioning institutions uh, for shaping the people to deal with the challenges that I talked about. Think tanks, um, groups uh, that cooperate not only within national boundaries, but cross-fertilise internationally. They need people coming in from appropriate education bases. Uh, Elliot was talking uh, very, very helpfully about this earlier this morning. There are a huge number of people out there who could make useful contributions to our field, but they just don't know how to get in, into it because you know, it's, it is highly specialised and, and a bit complex. <coughs> we have to think about sharing perspectives within alliances. It's not been done badly in the past, but as uh, the Cold War gets further and further away, the purposes of alliances become harder to define. And the sixth institution that we need to improve is the United Nations and make sure that there are more people with a solid training uh, in strategic policy making within their ranks uh, and fewer people uh, who just know about little bits uh, of uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America and so on. Well, what do we need to do? We need to educate uh, from secondary level upwards uh, in a, a more thoughtful way. We need to impart experience within these five groups of, of people uh, at first and second hand. We need to establish credibility for each group and they have to pass the test of what their peers think of them in argument. We have to hold open debates that are consistent with security. There are some things you can't talk about publicly, but there is an awful lot you can, and if you've got a knowledgeable electorate out there, then they're going to be much more interested. We need to establish dialogue between the professional communities, be they government, armed forces, think tanks, journalists and our political leaders. That's going to be a very big task. And then finally, we need to engage the voters because they will have the final choice. Let me stop at that.
take three questions first. Um, Elliot, Paul, what other questions? Okay. And Peter Evans, please. The mics. Okay, right. Thank you. Um, the question is, uh, it's actually covered in the question largely to you, but I'd be curious to get reactions. The comment is, uh, I very much take your point about uh, the need to address publics. And certainly there's a need for intellectuals to be out there in the public square talking about these things. But it seems to me it, it does rest primarily on politicians. Uh, to make the case for doing the things that we may think are desirable or kind of painful. Necessary to do in the world. And, and my only comment is, and I agree with this point, in my own country over the years, I don't really see any, anywhere in the world where it's a lot better. So maybe you can. Sure, I'd like to hear it. The, the second is, I, I'd like to draw you out a little bit more on the relationship between um, the politics and the studies community, if you will, and the uniform milk. Because it does, does seem to me okay. It does seem to me there's a big difference between suits and dresses talking to suits and dresses, as opposed to suits and dresses talking to uniforms. And you know, you painted a pretty dark picture of serious military professionals, and there are other names of people we both admire a lot who would kind of take uh, the the Jim Mattis or the French general's point of view. And I, again, I'm inclined to be pessimistic because I think those folks haven't been so busy over the, the last decade and a half. Um, they're actually not going to be inclined to step back and ask the first order strategic kinds of questions. So if you have thoughts, again, you just sort of um, elaborate a bit. And if, if you see you know, positive ways ahead, I'd really be curious to hear them. Then Paul. Peter in the back. Thank you. I thought that was um, a brilliant group, and if I might say so, the conference as a whole has been remarkably eclectic. Um, I don't know, I have to say this um, a bit bluntly. I've stopped going to double I, double S annual conferences. It's too exclusivist and it's too big. I've spent um, about equal amounts of time in my career in as a policy and then an intelligence practitioner and then as an academic. And just to pick up a couple of points and questions. You heard me say yesterday, I think, that in my view, most countries, including Australia, and in a different way Russia, are prisoners of their geography, their history, and their culture. And that's an appeal for us to work more with area specialists. We've got some in SDSC. Bob, you were quite right to raise Papua New Guinea. I think by 2030, its population will be close to 20 million, and we'll be about 28, and we will always have responsibility for that if something goes wrong and the place collapses. And let's remember it has a common border with a place called Indonesia. Which brings me to an associated point. Nobody has mentioned Indonesia. It is critical to Australia's national security. We benefit when it is democratizing, I don't say democratic, and stable. Prudent defense planners in this country will always plan against Indonesia going badly wrong, and we must always have the military capability to handle them in the CA gap. I mean, I ask the question of our intelligence community, what is the percentage chance of the Indonesian democratic experiment failing and us having an extreme Islamic military government. Now, the answer often from ONA is 10%. I'll tell you what, as a defense planner, that's good enough for me. It's not to see Indonesia as the enemy. We should be cooperating as much as possible. I'm talking about prudent defense planning. So I think we need to do more within our research school with the Indonesian experts. Secondly, you heard Brendan Sargent last night in a tremendously sensitive and insightful speech, which he'd written himself, talk about, and I think Brendan's, Taylor, you, you disagree with the other Brendan. I agree with the other Brendan. When I was Deputy Secretary of Defense, and I'm sure it applied with Hugh White, I could count on the fingers of one hand out of a staff of 2,000 
those who I thought might just make top strategic policy makers. Which brings me to my final point, Bob. And I know many of my colleagues will disagree with what I said yesterday. We're quite a fast-growing, eclectic organization. There is a danger we'll be coming across between an IR department and a military history department. That is not to say we don't need both those things. But I think I heard you say, and Hugh certainly said it, we sh what, what do we do to return to our traditional core capability? Or is that no longer relevant? Remembering that Tom Miller, you and Des founded our skill in defense policy and led the battle. We've got increasing competition from ASPE. What do we do about that? Very quickly, finally, Amitav. That was a brilliant exposition. On the issue of conflict resolution and the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Regional Forum is now in its 22nd year. It has three priorities in order. Confidence building, confidence building, um, uh, preventive diplomacy, which I'm currently involved with them in, and conflict resolution. We can't even get to first base after 22 years on preventive diplomacy, because the Chinese at every remove say preventive diplomacy is interference in internal affairs. Glad you comment. Peter. Uh, thanks very much to the organizers, and I congratulate everybody. I was cheering to the echo uh, two people who I've admired um, uh, for a long time, uh, Hugh Strawn admired from afar and Bob O'Neill fortunately from closer quarters uh, in many years, as a historian of war and a historian of foreign policy in this country. Uh, could I point to another problem which uh, is a sort of uh, obverse of the one that Hugh Strawn raised um, about the use and abuse of history? Uh, <clears throat> it's not only often the sort of history that we've been talking about here and that we're interested in is only conducted in, in uh, political science or international relations or strategic studies centers or departments. I can illustrate this by pointing out that um, sometime in the later Middle Ages I was a young research fellow uh, in this university uh, just down the road here. And at 11 o'clock every Thursday morning I had a dilemma because the weekly seminar from the history department, uh, was, which I was expected to attend as a member, I was writing a book on the early history of Australian foreign policy and policy making. <clears throat> but should I go to the weekly seminar, which was usually eminent historians but working on race, gender or class, or should I go at that precisely same time to the Department of International Relations, which had people like Robert O'Neill and Hedley Ball and J.D.B. Miller and others and people that they had brought in from overseas uh, to talk about, uh, to talk as historians about international relations in peace or war or, in, or both. Um, there's a gulf between his, history as it's understood and military or international or strategic or diplomatic uh, uh, history. Uh, in, in its institutional framework. I don't know how we counter that, uh, but I, uh, I just wish that somebody would set up a department of the history of war somewhere in this country. I'll just make one quick comment about um, Paul Dibb's remark about the, the need for closer ties to area experts. In the United States, at least, the, the loss or perhaps the absence of closer ties between strategic studies or security studies and then area studies is, is one of the great losses and, and tragedies of, of modern academia because it, certainly in the United States, and people know this, area studies was created precisely for national security purposes. It was a Cold War era uh, invention and it still receives tons and tons of government funding and at the undergraduate uh, and, and perhaps at the master's level there are still quite a number of uh, area studies majors who go to work for the intelligence community or things like that because they possess language skills and knowledge that, that's hard to find. But sort of at the, the PhD level and at the faculty level, that uh, discipline, if you want to call it a discipline, it reflects broader trends in academia and that it's been essentially captured by faculty who are essentially hostile to the mission uh, or hostile to the relationship between 
academia and government academia and national security. And so the relationship there is just not as strong as it could be and should be. And there are various initiatives going on in the United States, a couple of which I'm a part of now, that are trying to sort of break down that wall. But the, the divide is so deeply rooted that it's simply hard to do. Um, let, let me follow on on exactly that point, and, and uh, to begin with, before I go to, to Elliot's series of questions, uh, I mean, the UK problem is that uh, each of history and international relations now essentially have different criteria for understanding and developing the discipline. Um, and I took aim, if you like, at what international relations and politics might be doing. I could equally well take aim at history which has become much less engaged with public engagement and much more inward looking than was the case uh, two or three decades ago, precisely because of research expectation requirements. Um, and so the notion that, uh, and it goes back in part to what Elliot was saying when he was quoting Cardinal Newman, but the, you know, the, the notion that somehow you should be trying to look outwards rather than inwards to your discipline uh, is not something that is necessarily rewarded. I mean, the big ex uh, except, uh, exception in that is actually the last research framework included the expectation that public engagement uh, uh, and impact, as it was called, would be rewarded, which I think pro produces a slight glimmer. I mean, there is a real challenge here, and when I went to Oxford and succeeded Bob, one of my concerns was that actually to do both military history and strategic studies, and it reflects exactly your clash in timetables, was to do more than one person could possibly bear. I mean, that actually, this is, uh, you know, e not only does each of these disciplines now have different sets of expectations, but that actually, you know, the notion that you can embrace the entirety of all this uh, individually is just nonsense. It's not sustainable. This is why we produce multidisciplinary solutions to the problem. But we do need to find ways of having a more sensible dialogue than we've got at the moment. Um, and we do need to recognize uh, that actually the difference is the essence of, of, of where the creativity can lie, uh, rather than trying to squeeze uh, these disciplines into similar uh, outputs, because actually that's exactly where you lose the grit that provides the basis for the creativity, if I can mix my metaphors uh, too, mu too much. Um, to Elliot's question, let me begin with, with what I knew would be, if you like, the core flag, you know, who are the generals we most like to consult with? Well, Jim Mattis will be there among the, among the people we put on the, on the right side of the equation. And Vincent Desport is another um, highly intelligent officer, uh, who, I mean, now retired, working, making his money in the defense business in France. But, but uh, you know, these are people with whom we would find, we would find empathetic. So I, in taking aim at them, I don't mean actually to criticize what they're doing because what they were focusing on in what they said was absolutely their last. I mean, you know, it's their job. It was, it was the issue of the operational level of war. That's what they were focusing on. The question is, where does that lock in to exactly your point about the relationship with the politicians and, 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 and how do they, they, uh, they uh, perform? And, you know, to take, I, I, because I truncated the whole discussion of what I was going to say about democratization, to take you know, two examples, our late Prime Minister in the United Kingdom, David Cameron, in my uh, memory, three times said Britain faced an existential war uh, as a Prime Minister. Uh, after the attack in Algeria, after the attack in Tunisia at Sousse, um, and at one point during the Libyan crisis. Uh, did he have any intention, having used that f turn of rhetoric, to reflect the fact that we were engaged in an existential war? Absolutely not. Um, and so you have you know, politicians and generals, if you like, op occupying parallel universes that never seem to come together. National security councils, of course, uh, which have proliferated, including, of course, we have one in the United Kingdom, were designed in part to address that issue, uh, but still don't seem to me to have done so. And the reason they're in parallel universes is that to all intents and purposes, what we've been doing is engaging in inverted commas, or what in Cold War terms, in what in Golden Age terms, would be called limited wars. Uh, but we have used, in order to engage the public, because the public is reacting against these limited wars, we've used the vocabulary of existential conflict. 
Um, and so we have failed to provide a coherent way of describing them. We've recognized the problem because we produce things called strategic narratives. I would argue hybrid warfare is part of the recognition of the problem. Uh, it's just, uh, and I've, I've said elsewhere in the, in, in, in the last few days, it's a sort of mirror imaging. We're concerned about our own domestic resilience, so we look at seeing little green men as the threat. Uh, but, you, but what we're not actually engaging with is what is the policy outcome here and how do we adapt the military means or recognize the relationship between the military means and the policy outcome. Um, because our politicians are essentially engaging in a public debate because they recognize the role of democratization, they recognize the effect of the new media, they recognize the need somehow to reflect that back to their own publics. But what they're not doing is leading their own publics in recognition of what armed force can and cannot do, what its limitations are in terms of what it can deliver. Um, and actually, I believe, if, I, if I'm going to be positive for a moment, um, <laughs> this actually reflects a piece that David Kilcullen, I noticed, wrote in the Australian in response to the Nice attacks, uh, is actually what domestic terrorism requires to do, us to do is not so much to look outwards. I mean, that is a busted flush, really, in terms of engaging the public. Gordon Brown tried to do it in Britain. Hollande did it immediately in relation to the initial attacks. What it is, is to realize the role of democratic engagement in addressing domestic sources of domestic terrorism. That is one way into the, this argument. Domestic resilience is one of the ways into this argument of re-engaging. Um, and um, it would seem to me there that is, that is a positive outcome. One, just a couple of, you know, and I'm speaking, sorry, I'm going on too long, but one, a couple of other quick thoughts on the role of the professional military in this. Um, number one, I mean, apart from, you know, the need, it seems to me, to speak truth to power and to say what military force can't, can and can't do. Uh, there is, it seems to me, absolutely a, necessary, a necessity for the military to engage in lesson learning in a more proactive way. And to make that part of the public engagement of public debate is not just a military exercise. Of course, increasingly, it's across government exercise. Um, but you know, you and I were talking about this yesterday, Elliot, but I mean, the, the reluctance to engage with the consequences of Afghanistan and how you understand that uh, across the board seems to me uh, extraordinary uh, as an illustration of that. And the other is, and this is, was, has been referred to, is the need, I think Bob mentioned it, absolutely, Bob did, did mention it, is the need to recognize that actually those who wear uniform, given the fact that very often they're the ones who are most actively having to engage with what you understand war to be, have a crucially important part to make in this uh, contribution to make in the strategic debate, not in just the operational level of war debate. Um, and we may not need, I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not arguing that we need large numbers of people go back to the quantitative argument. There, actually, a few can go a very long way. Uh, yes. Um, Paul, Dave, uh, I should say that I recognize, uh, everybody should recognize the ASEAN Regional Forum was set up in 1984, sorry, 94. Next, uh, that year, Paul wrote a concept paper called ASEAN Regional Forum, a concept paper, which was adopted in the Brunei meeting of ARF, which outlined three stages, confidence building, preventive diplomacy, and conflict resolution, which the Chinese changed to elaboration of approaches to conflicts, but he gets all credit. What Des and I did uh, was basically to elaborate uh, the Preventive diplomacy. Our book was called The Next Stage. It's a Canberra paper. You can, it's still available. Uh, so how do you move from uh, co uh, confidence building to, co to preventive diplomacy? And we did a lot of work. I thought that was a key step. I didn't think ARF will ever do conflict resolution of the type that we see, the arbitration and all that. But we thought preventive diplomacy was possible. We spent a lot of time published that book in 1999. And unfortunately, uh, we haven't moved from conflict, confidence building to preventive diplomacy yet. But well, that's another story, but full credit to you, Paul. I just want to make a very quick point about area studies and uh, discipline, uh, international relations or strategic studies. This is a false debate. This is a very American debate. Such debates don't exist in Asia or Europe. Uh, a lot of uh, scholars in Britain, for example, who do international relations do area studies and vice versa. And in Asia, international relations rights in the back of area studies. Uh, so the United States, uh, there is this disparaging of area studies. I mean, uh, especially IR scholars and theorists think area studies, you know, these are people who like cameras and uh, take photographs and not do serious theory. Uh, but uh, luckily, we have a trend 
now where the, it is being effectively bridged on the ground, whether the funding for uh, uh, the, uh, area studies is declining or not. But it is being bridged, and the people who are bridging that is uh, like Tom Christensen, Ian Johnson, who are IR theorists of the highest caliber, but also area specialists uh, who study countries like China or other countries. We have here people like Evelyn, uh, who does IR theory, and Southeast Asia. I myself do Southeast Asia and IR theory. So it's being effectively bridged, uh, but not because of uh, uh, any, any uh, like conscious movement. Uh, and we need more of that scholarship. Quite frankly, I would be scared of, especially in universities, that uh, does pure area studies, just that. Because you don't have a dialogue, unless it is comparative area studies, which is a different field. So, 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 so I think uh, let's hope that more and more scholars, as they get trained, will have one foot on uh, the discipline and one foot on the area studies. And uh, that would be the way to go. We are close to the end. Yes. <clears throat> Dan, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, in response to Eliot's point, I agree very strongly that politicians have to be on the front line in terms of informing the people uh, what government policy is and then, and then defending it. But it's no good having politicians who simply stumble uh, over a script that somebody has put in front of them. More politicians have to realise that to give effective leadership they have got to know what national and international security is all about and be able to outline an intelligent position and defend it. And, and I think that is a major <coughs> responsibility for us in the, the think tank community. Um, <coughs> Paul, on your point regarding Indonesia, it, it would be a catastrophe for us if democracy were to to fail there, um, and it's something we have to to watch very closely. And your point on the the role of the uh, SDSC, um, I agree very much that it has to be focused on national policy and needs, in a way, to act as a kind of public monitor uh, where that can be done. Uh, in, a, in a secure manner, uh, a public monitor of the effectiveness of our defence policy and, and security policies. And of course, one, one way to do this is by more of these sorts of gatherings or even smaller groups uh, um, more, more directly related to the, the policy advisors within government. Peter, put, Peter Edwards puts his finger uh, on a very tough problem because if you're interested in uh, the history of, of warfare or a country's foreign policy and involvement in conflicts, uh, you do have to remember that you're part of a professional historian's community and you do need to have standing in that community. There is a, a long-standing prejudice in that community that was fed particularly during the Vietnam War, it's eased a bit since then, but prejudice against people who do the sorts of things that, that you do and Hugh does and, and I do. Uh, and <clears throat> the only way to cope with that is just to spend a bit more of one's precious time showing that you're not a beast with uh, cloven hoofs, a tail and horns, uh, and they will usually respond fairly well to a little, little bit of effort, but it is frustrating. That's one of, just one of the uh, realities of life we have to accept, I think. <laughs>